And so tonight, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Richard Wilson, who's a renowned urban planner, a professor at um, Cal Poly Pomona. He's authored numerous articles and books, and he'll be talking to you today about parking reform and affordable housing. So, Rick, are you comfortable with people asking questions in yeah. real time? Hi, everybody. So, uh, could you tell me uh, student, faculty, planning? Uh, students, um, my expertise are in housing, homelessness, and GIS. Hmm. Okay. I'm from Congressman Center's office. I cover housing, so I'm just here. Oh, I'm so glad. Please give my regards to the congressman and a warm congratulations on last night's success. I'm a business management student here. Oh, great. Oh, good. Welcome. Yeah, so um, I've been working on reforming parking requirements for quite some time. You may have heard of Donald Shoot. He's at UCLA. I studied with him. He wrote a book called The High Cost of Free Parking, which told planners their parking requirements were nuts and they didn't know what they were doing. And um, so he's kind of like, I'm like the parking whisperer to Don Shoot telling planners what they're doing is important. So I started out working in local government. I was a practitioner before I was an academic. So I know how hard it is for local planners to reform their parking requirements. And so compared to Donald, my work has been to uh, help provide a methodology for local planners to propose reforms to parking requirements that will make it easier to provide housing. So I've written a book on how to do that and a, and a book on parking management. So I'm going to say next slide and that's going to work. So I want to start with uh, ground zero of the problem. This is uh, Southern California, just east of Cal Poly Pomona where I teach. That's a shopping mall, that's a housing development, an office building and an arena there. And this is classic post-war um, separated land uses. Hit the button, please. Uh, just for clarification, that is Cal Poly area, right? Yes, or, that's, or? E that's east of Cal Poly. So it's not Bit, though, basically. No, I'm at Cal Poly Pomona in Southern California. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. well, I'll see Cal the other Cal Poly. Yeah, okay. no. Cal Poly Pomona. So okay. <clears throat> we're 30 miles east of downtown LA. And this uh -huh. is another. 20 miles east. That's the 15 that goes to Las Vegas. That's mm -hmm. the 10. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. So, um, single site development, retail, office, all on its own piece of land, and parking requirements set for the peak demand of any particular use and a little bit more. Next button, please. And so that produces an environment on the ground that has significant walkability challenges. It's a place for cars, not for people or bikes. And you can see the land isn't used very efficiently. A lot of, most of the land is devoted to service parking. So that's one problem with parking requirements that is for. That's what it looks like on the ground. And then those parking spaces are probably full 10 or 15 days a year. And the rest of the time, urban heat island, polluted runoff, wasted land. I want pop-up. Uh, urban agriculture, no one's done it, but you can <laughs> take for eight months of the year and repurpose this for a day. Next. But it's not just um, the classic suburban area that's a problem. This is the city of South Pasadena in Southern California. It's very walkable, small town, leave it to beaver feel. Um, and so parking is not dominating the streetscape. It looks pretty good, right? The parking is set behind buildings. In this case, the city's parking requirements were impeding economic development. A property owner lent me a space here for a pop-up gallery, and I watched her as she tried to attract tenants. And what this block needed was a restaurant, lunchtime type restaurant. The city's parking requirement was 10 spaces for every 1,000 square feet of building area. Impossible to find those spaces. So the city was inadvertently skewing their economic activity through parking requirements that were so actually, I worked with the city and they changed it. So hit the next two. So so it was a disincentive. It was impossible. It was impossible. You could not find ten secure ten spaces to meet the code requirement because it was a historic building built to the edges of the block. Oh. So what That's they awesome. did is they changed it to you only if it's a historic property you only have to have as much parking as you did when you started. This is like. Los Angeles has adapted a reuse ordinance which allowed conversion of office buildings to residential without providing any more parking. And this produced an incredible renaissance 
Council. As mentioned, no. One more button. Yeah, so roadblocks and revitalization. Okay, one more case. This is Huntington Park, a lower income community developed in a suburban model, a lot of housing crowding. So with the recession, more people per unit, and people sharing houses, it was designed for a certain density of people. The density is higher, so there's crowding on the on-street parking and a lot of conflict over parking. So it built out small parcels, people density equals parking anxiety. So these are three cases where parking problems are tied up in broader urban planning issues. So I call it the circle of vice. This is in LA, this is Houston, which has the biggest parking garages I've ever seen in my life. Next. So when city codes require more parking than is actually used, it impacts the site in favor of driving, lower in density. It makes it harder to serve the site with non-automobile modes, kind of that shopping mall example. It means there will never be a market price because supply is greater than demand. Developers, lenders, and tenants get used to this. Um, sharing parking between uses, which is a single no-brainer way of getting more efficient use of parking, doesn't happen. And then these expectations are created in the lending community, in the, uh, among planners, among developers, that a, a certain amount of parking is appropriate. And so it's a, these factors reinforce one another. So my central message here is parking is policy. It is a policy choice not an engineering standard or some, there's a right answer to parking. No, there's a policy answer to parking. I think, you know, it's kind of a nerdy issue. I was married before I studied parking, study, started studying parking. So, but I think if I hadn't been, I would have been able to do a date. I mean, at a cocktail party, like, what do you do? I studied parking, it's okay. So, um, <laughs> I think it's at the middle of the most important policy issues that we're facing. Transportation issues, design and urban form, economic development, sustainability, and significantly social equity. That was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should add that. So, I want to put parking requirements in their place. I'm not, I don't hate parking. I just think we should look at them appropriately. So, what's that expression? Parking is the tail that wags the dog yeah. of transportation, right? Here's parking. Here's why we have transportation systems. Connections between land uses. There's different ways of doing that through mixed land uses, telecommunication substitution of travel, transportation. So parking is way down the list, but we often treat it like it's where we're starting rather than when we're finishing. What's that expression of make, drink no coffee before it's time or something? It's too old. Reference. We run on coffee. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> my, my idea is we shouldn't build a parking space until we've tried everything we can do to get people to use other modes and get them to share parking. So parking should be a last resort rather than a first resort. That's rather backwards in, 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 in the way planning is. Exactly. <laughs> you come in as a developer, a city pulls out the code, how much parking do you have to buy? We start with that. Now, you know, yeah, progress in California with... One of the first questions, yes. <laughs> yeah, but we're moving to a VMT-based standard for measuring for impacts in super so, so we're moving, but yeah, that's... Yeah. Dang, next. So is it a habit that we have high requirements? Why do we do it, and, and this is my little funny bit, if it's an addiction, then I have a 12-step program. <laughs> so before I get into my 12-step program, why are things stuck the way they are? People who park want to keep things the way they are. So residents in a neighborhood who have their favorite on-street parking space want to keep it that way and often resist housing construction because they say those people are going to be competing for my space. Yes. Planners sometimes don't mind it if the parking requirements are too high because the developer says they're too high, I can't do it, and they say, okay, let's make a deal. I'll give you a parking reduction if you give me some open space or affordable housing. So sometimes planners are trading parking for Public 
works police departments say, I don't want to have to deal with resident complaints about parking, so they'd like to have too much parking. Um, setting up the case that local zoning codes, parking requirements need reform for various reasons. There's reasons in the suburbs, reasons in urban areas. And I'm about to say, so I have written two books on parking. One, the one I'm focusing on tonight is designed to empower local planners to make recommendations to eliminate or lower parking requirements and feel confident about that. Uh, and so I'm right now talking about why the status quo seems to persist, because parking can block housing development, it can be an impediment to economic development, and it's not good for sustainability. Yes. So next one. Um, the development community, you would think they would be an ally in reducing parking requirements because it's costly. But from their perspective, if every uh, project has to provide the same amount, and if they know about it in advance, the amount of money they pay for the land is lower to account for that cost. So in a way, if it's predictable and the same for everybody, they're not as adverse to it as you might expect. And actually, they're not used to figuring out how much parking they should really provide. Because the city always tells them. Right? So as cities, some cities are deregulating parking lots. Buffalo, New York, other places, uh, and so it's on the developer now. How much do you really need to serve the market, given the cost of developing it and the rental premium you get for having parking? Next. And finally, uh, groups that are opposed to development um, use parking concerns as a way of stopping projects that are higher density or for and I'm going to tell you how to overcome all these barriers. So it really is a 12 step program. <laughs> I love it. Okay. First step. Was that pun intended? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I got the idea from Donald Trump. He said he thinks it's an addiction, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I get it. So here are the 12 steps. I will go through them very quickly one by one. Uh, but I'm, my contention is no planner can claim to have a rationally based parking requirement unless they've gone through all these steps. And I'm afraid what cities planners often know what to do. They call their neighboring cities and say, oh, what's your requirement? We'll use that. Or they look up a number in the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Handbook, which is suburban biased and old, and they say, well, that's an official number. We'll use that number for our parking. So this is a more analytic approach. So next, please. So the first thing is I want evidence-based parking policy. Let's get utilization data. I did a study of the Inland Empire multifamily housing and found that parking was about 66% occupied overnight. And lots of studies are coming out now that are measuring parking occupancy and finding we're not fully using it. Next slide. Then we have to think of the future. It's so interesting. Plans look forward, and parking requirements have been looking backward. Yes. Looking at historical data, well, the world is changing. So buildings last a long time. So I reviewed the kind of changes that are happening, and most of them, most of them predict a reduction in vehicle ownership and a reduced need for parking in the future. The only one that's a plus, and this is significant, is increased occupancy in office buildings as we go to new arrangements without individual offices and increased residential occupancy because housing is so expensive. But in general, we're going to need less parking, I think much less parking in the future. Next. I don't know if these numbers are right, this is from The Economist, but people are saying in urban areas the amount of vehicles owned may be 50% of what they are in 20 years or so. And if you're building a project that's going to last 100 years, now I advise developers about the risk of overbuilding parking, and I advise them to build parking in a way that can be converted to another use site. Okay. This is in the weeds, but uh, the way parking requirements have been created is always adding an extra margin beyond what the average rate of parking use is by using a percent, 85th percentile. So there's a built-in process that bases measurements of parking and then ups them a bit to have a cushion. So I recommend using the average occupancy. Okay. 
right? We cannot have one parking requirement for different places. This is counties in uh, the New York region and the United States. This is park vehicles available for housing unit for owner occupied and rental. And looking at rental, you can see it's all over the place. So there's no way there's a correct parking requirement. There is only a parking requirement for a particular place. Next. Pricing. I encourage, I don't hate parking, but I don't think people should be subsidized to park. People are paying to use their bird scooters, they're paying to get on transit, they're paying for gasoline when they drive their car, and somehow they park free a lot of the time. So I think parking should have a price, and my PhD dissertation came up with this number roughly that a 1% increase in price is a 0.3% decrease in parking demand. So people are responsive to the cost of parking, and we should price it at what it costs to collect. Unbundling means when you rent your apartment, you don't get two free spaces. You have a decision to make. Your rent is lower, and the spaces are $80 a month, and you decide if it's worth it. See, it's unfair to make people who don't have cars pay for parking spaces. That's an unfair thing. Yes. Next. We need to think about everything that's going on with active transportation, transit improvements, bicycle improvements. This is my favorite family. Mm -hmm. It's on Venice Boulevard in LA. And every Saturday I see them and they do the grocery shopping with their kids. There's another tandem bike in front of them and they're making it work. And LA just did a controversial protective bike lane here to make it safer. So we need to adjust parking requirement for alternative mode of use. Next. And then, this is one of my students, and I'm kind of picking on him, but he, he works for City of El Monte, and he has a parking space with his name on it. That's the last thing you want, because it means no one else can use the space when he's not there. So we need to do better internal sharing of spaces. So in a residential complex, usually you give them a sign space. And you do, people prefer that to know where the space is. But that means there's no sharing. A visitor can't park there when that person's gone. So if we can have sharing, we can have less space. <clears throat> Here's a, a container store in Old Pasadena. It's a brand new development with zero parking. Why? because they pay a fee every year to the city of Pasadena who built this structure to have spaces in that structure. So the, if the efficiency of sharing parking in, a, in public structures is what helped old Pasadena have its revitalization. This was before it was popular, kind of, or before it was naturally happening. So using off-site parking. Next. And then sharing parking between uses. This is the, the demand pattern of a cinema. This is the, the demand pattern of an office building. If you put them together and you share, you have less total parking required because when the cinema's demand is the highest, the office building is almost infinitesimal. So it's very small. So there's obviously sharing in mixed use developments, but I want sharing among uses side by side and the design of facilities so sharing is possible. In Germany, in some cities, they don't allow a developer to build parking under the building. They make it be in a shared facility, which is efficient from a parking standpoint and requires people to walk on the street from the parking to their house. So go through those nine steps and say, and I'll show you the numbers, how they work, but does the perspective rate really support community goals? Is this what we really want? So I say iterate this process and think about these broader transportation design, economy, and sustainability goals. Two more things to get to 12, space size. I work with many cities that have space size requirements and make it very difficult for the developer to provide the parking. Uh, I worked in Riverside with a developer and uh, went to the city and recommended some reductions in space size. And this planning commissioner put up his hand and says, and this was for an infill urban project, and the planning commissioner said, I have a big truck, 
I would have trouble getting my truck in that parking. And I'm like, okay, I'm dead. And the, the planning, other planning commissioner said, Bob, you're not going to live there. Right? In other words, this idea that parking spaces must all be large for, it, for the largest potential use, you can manage that problem. You can have some smaller, uh, larger spaces and designate large vehicles for that. And in urban areas, people tend not to have large vehicles. So less, smaller parking spaces, smaller drive aisles is more efficient. And soon, our cars are going to be parking themselves. And they're not going to need space for the doors to swing open because you will get out of your car at the entrance of the parking garage and it will park itself. And they'll be able to stack themselves in aisles and things. So there's so much efficiency on the way. So don't make the spaces too big. And finally, nobody likes tandem parking. Tandem parking is where you have two spaces. This is the garage and then they have a space behind it. So if this car needs to get out, this one has to be. But it's extremely efficient in using the site. You can get more units on the site. You can lower development costs. So in this case, this is the city of Oxnard. The city approved some parking reductions for this project. They, uh, they did the tandem parking. They didn't manage the parking, and the city didn't manage its on-street parking. So people said, I'm just going to park on the street instead of that tandem spot city up in arms, they were going to raise their parking requirement, so I, with the developer, said, look, what you really need is parking management, and not getting rid of tandem spaces. If you don't want people parking on the street, then prohibit overnight parking on the street or charge for it. So things like tandem parking, mechanical parking, valet parking, are ways you can to increase the efficiency of using the space that's very valuable and expensive. So, those are, this is an example of how this system works. You start with a rate that you measure and you make all these adjustments based on the nine factors that I've talked about. In this case, this is a conservative suburban city, so they end up actually predicting 1.7 spaces per unit um, when they measure the site at 1.65, but it could easily go the other way where you lead to a reduction of half a space per unit, 0.7 spaces per unit. Or you might conclude you don't want to require parking at all and leave it up to the developer. Now to do that, you have to manage the on-street parking because the community will say, oh, if you do that, parking's going to spill into my neighborhood. Okay, so that's, that has to come away. So let's continue next. <clears throat> so what's happening nationally with parking requirements? The traditional approach is the minimum parking requirement for every developer is set more than what's actually used. And so one reform is to lower the minimum closer to what is actually used. Some cities are saying, we're not going to, like Philadelphia, we're not going to require what's actually used. We're going to require something lower and let the developer decide if they want to make up that difference. And then some cities are doing partial deregulation. So in LA, the adaptive reuse ordinance in downtown Los Angeles says, as I mentioned, if you're converting historic building from office to residential and it has no parking, you don't have a parking requirement. And this has produced an incredible amount of development of these conversions in Los Angeles. And then cities like Buffalo have gone all the way, uh, partly for economic development reasons, and said, we don't have it. Portland's lowered their parking requirements outside their downtown. Um, there's a lot of activity. It's taken three decades to make it happen, with John shooting, shouting to the masses and all of us working on this, but it's really quite exciting. Next. So what kind of reforms are appropriate? And these are the easiest to the hardest. So one thing is allow on-street parking to be counted as the visitor parking. A lot of city codes say so many spaces per unit plus half a space per visitor. Or you could eliminate the visitor parking. Now, this is not saying you don't care about visitors coming to the site. It is saying that um, there should be a market mechanism to provide parking. If if city has on-street parking, it should price it. And visitors can decide if they want to pay a high price to park right near the development or a lower price to park a block away. Next. 
unbundling parking costs from rent or purchase price, I think, is a very significant change. It changes the thinking of, I rented an apartment and it comes with two spaces, so I might as well have two cars in them. It's free to do that. To, I'm renting a two-bedroom apartment. How many, how many cars should we have? Should we have two? Can we get away with one and save 80 or $100 a month or $200 a month from where you are? It puts that choice in the in the renter's mind. Um, we could lower minimums because we expect vehicle ownership to be lower in the future because of TNCs, shared mobility, possibly of coming autonomous vehicles, and go all the way down to no minimum requirement, which does not mean no parking is built. What it means is parking is only built when the price of it is sufficient to pay for it. And the price is, you know, underground spaces, 40,000, 50,000 space, structure, 20,000 space. It's a, a large amount of cost, and compared to, especially if you're developing small units, the parking area can be as big as the unit, right? Which is like, do we care about homeless people or homeless cars? We act like we care about homeless cars more than homeless people. We take better care of the cars than the people. Okay. Um, and so, what other things can you do to help this transition? Um, lots of experiences in the Bay Area with uh, Transform and their Green Trip program, where developers give free transit passes either to start or for a fixed period of time. Taking care to provide enough space for temporary car rentals and curb space for shared mobility pickups. Bike parking. Interesting, uh, I think in Berkeley they said to a developer, we think you need this much parking. Developer said, I only think I need that much. Why don't I build this much with enough clearance that if you do a development agreement, if there's not enough in three years, I will install mechanical parking. So the idea of instead of going for everything you think you might ever need at the development permit process, doing a development agreement that says, let's see how this goes, given all this changing. Uh, I work with a developer in the city of Hawthorne, right across from SpaceX, and he's going to give priority in the rental process for employees of SpaceX who can just walk across the street. Pet improvements, bike facilities, keep going. And then there's a lot of bells and whistles, so next slide, two parking ordinances. Some are, it's ironic, we require parking and then we tame it. <laughs> and taming means preventing parking, too many curb cuts from affecting the pedestrian environment or requiring ground floor retail so we don't create dead spaces, um, permeable pavement, all sorts of things here and here. Supply regulations such as um, some cities adopt maximums, which I'm not that crazy about. The developer is dumb enough to build too much parking, I say let them. And someone else will use it in the future. Um, but planners in a regulatory mindset, I'm a planner, but say, well, if the minimum is wrong, we should have a maximum. I don't think that is. <laughs> so I wrote uh, this book. And what I presented to you is about this parking reform. And I made presentations a lot. Uh, Transform had me up. I did them in Palo Alto, Mountain View, Redwood City, City of San Jose. And of course, what I learned from the planners is that's all well and good. But if we propose this, the community is going to be in saying, you're going to make a mess of my neighborhood with spillover parking. So there is, you have to do parking reform and parking management together. So that's what brought the second book is how to manage parking to prevent community backlash saying you just move the parking problem from the developer's responsibility to our neighbor. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, we need to manage curb parking. And so the way cities do that now is with residential permits, which are given to residents, which means 
um, like somebody works in an office, the next, the next parcel cannot park in the neighborhood. So that is a way of protecting neighborhood parking from impacts of a parking spillover. I kind of have a problem with it because it's implying that people have an ownership stake in the public right of way, which doesn't exactly make sense to me. Um, so the main thing I want is, you know how San Francisco has done um, dynamic pricing, variable pricing with the meters, LA has done it, Washington DC has done it. Right now under California law, residential permit programs, the price charged by the city has to be only the administrative cost of offering the permit. The price cannot be a market-based higher price. So you get all sorts of problems where people are competing for the number of permits and people are parking on the street instead of their garage because they have a permit. It creates kind of winners and losers, those with permits, those without. So uh, Vancouver, Canada has changed that. So they're charging $30 a month a month, not a year, for residential permits in some neighborhoods. They're rolling out very carefully. People that already lived there are grandfathered in, so it's only new people. But it's introducing this idea that just like in a downtown area, that you should have the most popular spaces priced. Right? I got into this when I was a starving grad student. I lived in East Hollywood, and I had three cars. I don't know why. They, they didn't run. They were terrible. <laughs> But parking on the street was free, so there's no reason for me not to have too many cars. Now, the objection to this is equity, that the $30 a month fee would harm lower income drivers. So a grad student of mine who presenting at a TRB did a, a simulation analysis of three low income neighborhoods in Los Angeles and found that yes, for the very lowest income class, 15K and less, it's a significant impact of, in their income. Once you get beyond that, it's not as regressive as people say. And of course, you can compensate low-income households for that. Um, City of Santa Fe introduced parking pricing around their downtown. The objection was that restaurant workers who work late, come late, must drive for their jobs are disproportionately impacted. They developed a program that rebates low-income workers for the parking charge. So we have to change state law to do this. I think it's 64 that's the law that says, it, you know, it's the law that relates to whether it's a fee or a tax and stuff. But um, that is a tool that will make pricing work in residential areas as it does work in downtown areas. That's the These are things you can do for off-street parking as well as the on street Next. So how to make this happen? And I'm a practical person and I work as a transportation and parking consultant, so I get yelled a lot at and I've been into many you know, community meetings where people are very agitated about parking. So let's talk about how to make that happen. This is Laguna Beach. These were the most reasonable people I ever worked with. They'd all read Donald Sheep's book. It was just like, it was like a very high level conversation, but it's not often that way. Half the time people say, Whatever I'm about to say, I don't believe it. In, uh, in Oxnard, I, you know, you look up in the American Community Survey the average vehicle ownership. So you can look up how many cars are owned. And I said, it's 1.68. And somebody said, this man is very stupid because no one owns 1.68 car. Right? Um, so let's go to the next slide. That's a picture of a happy what I have learned is if you roll out with parking reform by itself, it's very controversial and it might not work. So I worked in Whittier. They did a new downtown plan that included pricing parking and shared parking. And so we proposed on-street parking pricing. And um, the council said five years ago we would have said absolutely not. But now we see we have to do this to get this broader community vision. So linking the reform to broader goals of sustainability or community revitalization works. Education works sometimes, but in the area of parking, a lot of people don't want to be educated particularly, so I always try that. <laughs> I like to appeal to self-interest. City manager, do you know how much tax revenue you're, you're losing by not efficiently managing your parking? 
Um, and then, of course, the great self-interest strategy that Donald Shoup worked on is parking benefit districts, where in return for parking pricing, some or all of the revenue is used for community improvements. So really, his idea is look at that parking meter as not a, a terrible intrusion, but like an oil well that generates revenue for your neighborhood when other people come in and pay for the parking. And also, there's lots of allies. So here's a, you know, here's a comparison of space use. Um, nice infographic, two bedroom apartment, 900 square feet is, if it has to provide one and a half spaces, that's 488 square feet apart. So roughly a little more than half uh, of the actual living space. And this person has done it for restaurants and other uses. Next. Seattle, I don't know if you both know about their right size parking program. They did extensive parking utilization surveys. They made a calculator that helps developers and community groups assess how parking demand varies across space in Seattle and then helps you test um, the impact of free transit passes and other things that can reduce parking demand. And and I mentioned Transform with their green trip process is encouraging developers to think about comprehensive package of accessibility services rather than think of just parking. So if Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan, are you guys old enough to know who they are, wrote a song together, I know who they are. it would be called Paid Paradise Revisited. <laughs> Paint Paradise is the Joni Mitchell song. But it was made popular like in the 90s by another band who covered it, right? Yeah, in the 2000s. I think so, yeah. So um, these are the resources uh, I have, and um, I brought a couple of books tonight, but mostly I would like to have a discussion now and answer your questions. Thanks for reminding me. Thank you very much. No, I'm sorry, I came late. Did you talk about how, how you deal with? Fluctuations of parking demand. Say so, so somebody has, you know, the park, parking is not a constant demand. There are yes. times we have a, a huge, huge demand, yes. and other times where there may be none. And that's that's the reason for shared parking. So, if there are fluctuations and each site is an island responsible for its own parking, then each site has to have parking size for the up part of the fluctuation, and that collectively produces way too much parking. So the idea of shared parking is if you have a public structure or a private structure and different uses around it, as this one is high, maybe this one's low and it can balance out through the sharing. But I know I studied uh, office buildings and I found occupancies between three or four people per thousand square feet to up to 10. So if an office building is sitting there and becomes a call center, or a mortgage processing facility, the employee density goes up, and you're right, the parking demand goes up. So the idea of sharing across land uses for those that have high demand can make private arrangements, leases, and so on to, to, to accommodate that. City of San Clemente, nice little downtown beach community. All the merchants said we need a parking structure. What they did is they entered in short-term leases with private property owners who weren't using all their parking. They would mark some of it. The city said, we'll be responsible for it. We'll enforce it. And instantly, they created hundreds of spaces. Now, they're paying some money, but the cost compared to building structure is much less. So I think shared parking is the key to fluctuation. And mixed uses help with that as well. And perhaps also, is that there's a system element um, I, I was thinking, of, I have a friend who lives in London, mm -hmm. and he owns a Land Rover for what a very long time. But he parked, he, he rents a space way out in the suburbs. Yeah. But because there's a good transit system, you know, he probably uses the car once in a few months. Uh, but, but, you know, and why, so why does it? Matter. But, but the fact he can get to it by transit pretty reliably, you know, so the rest of the time he can use transit. And you know what I notice in urban locations, people that are moving into those new apartments, some of them want to have a car, but they're not going to use the car every day. So off-site parking location, I think, is a no-brainer. 
but you have to have a system, a reliable yeah, exactly. system to get there. Exactly. Yeah, but those, because we're making such progress with what first last mile stuff, with scooters and Uber and Lyft and everything else, that's that problem is lessening. So I think if I was a smart developer in downtown, I'd build very little parking, make arrangements for people who insist on having a car and use it once a week to store that car, you know, at the edge of the downtown or in the cheaper area. Yeah. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> You just mentioned about the possibility of the state bill to eliminate the local jurisdiction for charging people based to based on the cost for the local. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, so I. Think so there's a state law to right. mandate. Right. It was a state. proposition that oh, said proposition. you can't. Sixty four maybe. Okay. Okay. That, that, and it was mostly about cities. Turning fees into tax. tax. Yes. So the and city so can only do permit, cost recovery versus. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so permit parking got cut up in that. Right. But if you would like to change that. Yeah, that we'll we'll have to go back to the voter. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Not something that we can decide. Oh, that's right. And sentimental. So. so this is where we need an extremely broad coalition and and kind of identifying the cost. So to me. In fact, this is about housing. Mm. The cost of that is resident anger about parking in neighborhoods, residents starting to look at parking as a civil right, and residents objecting to good infill development and affordable housing. So it is lo locking housing production, not being able to manage the parking resources in the neighborhood. Was there any pullback in housing? They took away the requirements from commercial buildings. Uh, well, what they did is they they said to developers in this uh, old Pasadena district, and it's not a one-time in lieu fee; it's an annual fee. And they there were, see the developers couldn't find the parking anyway. So actually. Many people attribute much of the success of their revitalization to the city's proactive investment in three parking structures. Sensitively built with ground floor at the retail, not you know, a big massive thing. Um, redevelopment agencies traditionally use building parking structures as an incentive to economic development. But the times have changed so much that the narratives of we won't build without our own parking, when I started on this in the 80s, that's what I heard. And uh, um, investors, lenders, um, national chains like Target had their own parking requirements. And planners often said, well, it doesn't matter if I lower the parking requirement because the developer will insist on that. And that's what's changing. There's a new breed of infill developers. I met with a developer who was building 1,000 units at the West Oakland station a few months ago with zero parking. So, so the change is afoot now, and it's a special class of investors, and a special class of lenders, and a special class of developers, but they now exist, and before it, it was true, it would be hard to get financing. So we're now working on the GIS project for the city of San Jose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definition of by, by anywhere in the country what underutilized is defined as a city code or anywhere. So I've been doing a lot of our research in regards to a definition and coming up with a formula so that way we could go forward to a planning commission and say this is what underutilized is. Do you agree or disagree? So that's where we're at in the process for now. 
And once we get a definition going, then we can start um, addressing those opportunities for housing and start activating some infill development and, 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 and increasing our housing stock currency So, I don't think there can be a universal definition of underutilized. I think it relates, I, th I mean, if it was me, I would get some real estate market analysis to show underutilization is relative to land prices, right? Yes. If you have very low land prices, uh, a low intensity use of the site, you can't, it's underutilized mathematically, but from a market perspective, not so much. Whereas in a high, va high land value location, having a surface parking is ridiculous underutilization. So exactly. I don't think there's a standard, but I think I would try and make it market-based. The, the other issue is that, especially with surface parking in downtown, so the first thing is there's no such thing as a historically significant surface parking lot, right? Yeah. So this idea of development without displacing anybody is, so building on surface parking lots, in, in LA they're looking for homeless housing on city-owned parking lots. Um, so the thing is to understand why the lots remain empty or why sites are underutilized. And for a long time, surface parking was a way to buy and hold land for speculative purposes and get some revenue without spending any capital on it. So the other thing is that landowners may not be up for this game, or they may be. But it's, I really think you have to have some savvy real estate analysis because the property owners may thwart what you may have an idea of a rational reuse and they're not interested in it because they have another goal. They're a, a buy and hold investor or something like that. So this is the kind of stuff that redevelopment agencies used to do and be good at, and we kind of lost that capability. But I think that's that would, but it's a fascinating, I'm glad you're doing it. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer opportunity to build on, on um, surface parking lots. If you have to have parking, then build a shared structure and build multiple projects around the shared structure. <clears throat> Any other questions? Well, please join me in thanking our visiting scholar.